So today's talk will be about GraphQL and why it's no excuse to stop writing docs. Because for me myself, I work in developer experience, so I always try to give developers using the products I work on the best possible experience. And part of that is also writing documentation. And there is this general misconception that GraphQL is self-documenting, which in a way it is, but in a way it also isn't. And also if you're using other types of APIs or maybe other types of code that are supposedly self-documenting, you can use this talk to figure out if you're actually doing a right job by not writing API documentation anymore, or if you should start writing API documentation right away. So what is documentation? I'd like to start off with this. And probably as you're all at this event, you have a fair share, um, well, you have some knowledge about documentation. You probably have an idea what documentation actually is. So I always like to think of documentation in this way. It could be a book about using a computer. So it's a user manual of a Commodore 64, which is one of the earlier computers that people took in their home and started playing with. But then also a hieroglyph. And this is actually the Rosetta Stone, which is a stone that was used to figure out how to read hieroglyphs. So you can say this is also a type of documentation. People created this stone not only to figure out how hieroglyphs work, but also to help other people understanding hieroglyphs. So these are two things that are actually types of documentation. And in this talk, I'm going to be explaining uh, what documentation is and how it adheres to GraphQL. Uh, and most of all, why if you're using GraphQL or using any other library that helps you to self-document your code or the product you create with code like, API like APIs, or you still might need to be writing some API documentation in order to get like this full circle of knowledge to the people using your product. What about by myself? As I already told you, uh, my name is Roy. I'm from Amsterdam, which is where I usually are. I wrote some books. I like to give talks, both remote and in person. So I'm uh, lucky enough, I'm in London giving a remote talk. Well, tomorrow I'm also going to an in-person conference. So that's supposedly uh, best of both worlds. Uh, during daytime, I work for StepSam, which is a GraphQL as a service company. So we make it easy for people to build GraphQL APIs. And my role there is developer experience. I try to make it as easy as possible for everyone to use the product. So this is API documentation. It's also onboarding flows. Um, basically anything you can think about to make the product and the service as easy as, as possible for people to understand. And next to that, I also give trainings and workshops about all the technologies I like. Uh, and I also do some mentoring for people that are just getting started in the developer relations world. And also, of course, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, if you type my name, you can probably also find me on LinkedIn where I share uh, knowledge as well. So that might be a good way to connect after the event and you still have some questions that you hadn't had answered today. So let's get back to um, our documentation. And as you, you might know or probably know documentation is any form of communicable material that you use to describe, instruct, or explain um, something, which can be a product, it can be a service. And if you ask the internet, it is an object system procedure, parts, assembly, installation, and blah, blah. Meaning that documentation is quite wide, but most of all, it is material that you create or that is auto-generated to describe, explain, or instruct how to do something or how to use something. And for this, I'd like to say documentation is communicable material. So it is material that you can use to communicate with people, systems, or whatever. Maybe in future, you want to communicate with robots or AIs for that sense. So this is documentation, of course, because these are ways, these are communicable materials that you can share with other people. So you have to use your manual, you have the Rosetta Stone hieroglyphs, both things can be shared with other people or maybe AI in future to actually uh, understand how something works. But this is also a form of communicable material. And this is probably a bit more closer to uh, whatever you're doing in your daytime. So it is documentation like the GitHub documentation. And also if you buy stuff at IKEA, you can find materials like this. So this also is a form of documentation. It instructs people how to use something that you buy at IKEA how to construct it and actually have like a table or actually this nice playing castle for children or adults uh, for your house. And documentation from GitHub, of course, is also a good example of 
communicable material that you can use to instruct, but also explain. So it's maybe a bit more uh, wider than the IKEA uh, instruction manual would be. Or if you're thinking GraphQL APIs, we can look at GraphQL. So GraphQL, so it's Graph IQL, uh, meaning this is a interactive playground, hence the I, of exploring GraphQL APIs. And maybe you know, maybe you don't. GraphQL APIs are, um, well, they're APIs, but they rely on a GraphQL schema. And this schema can usually be introspected. It's how we call it. So computers can read this schema and then extrapolate it in any way they like. And a common way is doing it in GraphQL, which is a way to interact with GraphQL APIs. It looks a bit like this, and it recently had a huge revamp. So let's give it up for the graphical team, because if you've been using GraphQL in the past and you really haven't been using it lately, it used to be looking like, well, GraphQL was open source in 2015. The GraphQL playground before also looked like it was built in 2015. And today it looks quite modern. So really give it up for the graphical team here, which is an open source team related at different companies working on uh, this great interface that we can use today. So this is how you would, um, this is the documentation you would get for most GraphQL APIs. Uh, and then documentation shouldn't only be a communicable material, it can also be both static and dynamic, meaning that the static documentation is probably the thing you saw from IKEA. And dynamic could be whatever you saw for GraphQL, because in there you can actually try out queries. So if you don't know what a query is, a query is an operation that you can use to read information from a GraphQL API. So it's pretty much like sending a GraphQL, pretty much like sending an API request. Uh, you can do this from the graphical playground. So if you ever saw Swagger, uh, you probably know what I mean with GraphQL API documentation. Swagger is kind of similar. So documentation could be both static and dynamic. And for GraphQL, it actually is dynamic if you're using GraphQL. So this is pretty static. Uh, it is paper or it is a website that doesn't do much. You can go there, you can click on stuff, but you can't really interact uh, with the product you're trying to uh, get more information about. While dynamic is API playgrounds, like we saw for graphical, uh, but also Postman is an example of API playground uh, code examples, which also can be dynamic. So the sponsor of this event, StackBlitz, they actually make it possible to have interactive code examples and quite often I see people uh, embedding um, these sort of code examples they have that are interactive also in their documentation. So that's one great way to have dynamic documentation as well inside your static documentation, which I will be uh, going more in depth on later on. And then of course, graphical is a great way to have dynamic documentation because you cannot only figure out um, what a product looked like, you can also interact with the product directly. And this documentation that is communicable material, so it can be static or dynamic, it can be a website, it can be a piece of paper, uh, it can also be an API playground, is used to describe, explain, or instruct how something works. So that is also what all the examples we saw do. They will describe something, they will explain or instruct how to use uh, the product or service you're creating the documentation for. Meaning that if you would look at a API documentation, this is an example of a open API, I think, or just some API reference list. It is typically for describing. You cannot do much. It describes how something works uh, because you can find all the things you can do there, all the API endpoints, the uh, results it might return, the error codes it might return, uh, the parameters it takes whenever you're sending a request. It's pure description. You cannot really do anything with it. You have to go and take this um, description and use it somewhere else to actually use the product. And it shows a list of attributes like an API reference or an SDK reference. So it doesn't really matter if it's an API, it can be a library that the people using inside code. It can also be the back of a book. So if you have a large book, typically there is a list at the end, which you can use to find out at what pages specific terms are being called. It's also a way to describe um, how the book and how the information flow looks like. And then there's a second attribute, which is explaining. So it can be like a nice diagram. So maybe inside your descriptions, you will have nice diagrams that explains how a flow works like. So maybe it has at one point, it says like a user signs up, 
a user gets an email and then a user does something else. So this would be one way to go to an explanation flow. And you explain concept, procedures, uh, or basically anything else that you'd like to explain to a user. So it's not a plain description, it's actually an explanation. So it's getting more interactive already. And then you have Instruct, of course, which is one of my, the biggest part of my job working in developer experience. I'm also creating instructions like tutorials, workshops, um, how to use something, how to maintain something. So this is something I built at StepSen. It is part of a documentation, and this is where I explain how you can use the product step-by-step. Step. So it goes beyond the API documentation where you describe how things work or where you explain how a flow might look like. Actual instructions like steps one to N is also a way of documentation because you instruct a user. It's not really documentation they can use as a, as a handbook. It's more of a, it's not really a reference. It's more of a handbook they can use to actually build something themselves. And for GraphQL APIs, uh, we have something similar, right? So uh, we saw we have graphical and then maybe you have another way to document it. So here a hard question. Uh, and if you looked at the, the title of this uh, talk, you probably already know, is GraphQL really self-documenting? I think it's an ex a question you have to, uh, to ask yourself, is GraphQL really self-documenting? And if you look at the uh, attributes we saw before, you want to explain, instruct, and describe, you might want it to be static and dynamic, then the question is, is GraphQL really self-documenting? Because we have a graphical, and we also have a GraphQL schema. So you could look at the GraphQL schema as a description. It describes what the GraphQL API looks like, what the characteristics are, but it doesn't let you, ex it doesn't really explain how it works. It also doesn't instruct you how it should work. So GraphQL API will have a schema at its core. And in here you can find all the data definitions and all the possible operations. Uh, and then you can use introspection to get all the information of the schema and use it to build something like graphical. But what's important to remind is graphical is optional. So if you're not using graphical, you might not even have documentation for your GraphQL API. So is GraphQL really self-documenting? Well, it's only self-documenting up to a small amount. So you have the GraphQL schema, which describes what the GraphQL API looks like. Every GraphQL API would actually release this schema if you send an introspection request, meaning that it's somewhat self-documenting. If you add graphical, it's already more self-documenting because you can actually inspect what it looks like in an interactive way, but it's only self-documenting up to a small amount. Because the power here is really in the schema that you create whenever you're creating GraphQL API, and then the introspection, which is inside the GraphQL spec, that lets you introspect the GraphQL API to get a visual uh, representation of the schema. And then you can use tools like Graphical to visualize that for your end users. So this schema, will expose, uh, can be exposed to introspection, and then you can use it in tools like Graphical. So this will be one way that GraphQL APIs could be considered self-documenting, because you have the schema, you can make the schema um, available to other people using introspection, and then you can use tools like Graphical to visualize it. And there is also similar tools to Graphical, so if you don't like Graphical for whatever reason, you might be using other tools like GraphQL Playground, Apollo Studio, or a GraphQL Editor. So these are either paid or free options to get a different experience in interacting with GraphQL APIs and using some of the self-documenting uh, capabilities that GraphQL in theory has, but that you as creator of the API should still be uh, making available to the end user of the GraphQL API. But then another hard question is, are these tools actually enough? So these tools that we saw, which are um, introspection and graphical, is this sufficient to give users all the information they need to be able to use your GraphQL API? Well, we earlier saw that documentation is communicable material used to describe, explain, or instruct what your product or service looks like. I think we covered describe and explain we didn't really discover instruct, I guess, or maybe we didn't cover or describe enough. So let's see how this actually applies to GraphQL APIs. In graphical, we can see we have a way to describe what the API looks like. So this is a visual representation of the GraphQL schema. If you would open a graphical and maybe have time later, um, 
Otherwise, you get a pre pretty good idea right now. You can see the GraphQL API is described. So you can see uh, the fields that are available for querying and then the queries that are available. So these are a bit like the endpoints. So you can find the sort of endpoints that are available for this GraphQL API. So it actually helps you describing what the API looks like. It also instructs you in some way because you can actually use it. So you can actually use this field to set in, uh, you can put comments there. So you can actually already put in some demo uh, requests that people can use. So you can use it to instruct. You can put steps in there that you may comment or comment in, comment in or comment out. Uh, so there are ways to instruct people using graphical. But what's missing is explanation. You can give people a graphical but they, don't, they can't find the steps how to query your GraphQL API. So they would need to know the endpoint. They would need to know any headers that they might be needing. They need to know if it's using HTTP or some other framework um, to sending the request to and from. So the explanation is kind of missing. Uh, you can still add some sort of description or explanation. So if you're creating a GraphQL API, you can actually give descriptions to fields and queries in there. So, this is one way to describe um, what a type looks like to the user of your GraphQL API. And you can use single line or multi-line. And by using comments inside your GraphQL schema, you can give more information to the user of your GraphQL API. But still, it's more information, so it's a bigger description. It's not necessarily an explanation how they should start using it. I mean, you could, uh, if you look at above type customer, you can actually give a multi-line description that's using Markdown, because if you use graphical, it can parse Markdown. And in there, in theory, you could put a tutorial style something in there. But the UI of graphical isn't really made to put in tutorial style stuff. So you can use schema annotation to actually make it easier for people to know what's going on. But you can't really use it to explain how the GraphQL API works. So graphical and all the other tools I showed you before, they are missing or actually lacking in-depth expl explain features. So a way to explain the user how to use this GraphQL API. You can describe what an API looks like. You can instruct them on using the GraphQL API, but you can't really explain how it works because you're missing some longer form text stuff or maybe a way to put in videos to actually explain what's going on. So what are we missing? We're missing a way to install the API or maybe install any libraries you need for the API. We're missing information around authentication. So you don't really know if you uh, how to shape the request to the API. And there's also missing some troubleshooting. So maybe you're getting an error message. What does the error message mean? What can I do if I get a certain error? Are there any requirements? So do I need to run Windows or uh, Apple? Do I need to use a certain browser? Do I need to use JavaScript or Python or Go? This is all information that is missing from a graphical interface. So earlier we already learned documentation could be both static and dynamic. And in my opinion, graphical is heavily dynamic. dynamic. So it's missing some static uh, ways to explain people what data, um, how to use your API. So it's missing the explanation part. So it's dynamic in ways of describing and instructing, but it's lacking static capabilities to give videos or extra tutorial style explanations. So it's mostly dynamic. Uh, and it's space we need for text, uh, graphics, and videos. So often what I do when I create documentation, I like to put in text, of course. I like to put in graphics. I want to show like, uh, if you do something there, it'll change something there. Maybe it gets merged there, or maybe you need to go that way or that way if you want to try out this. And then something else I really like is videos, because you can create it. You could have done in a page like this. So it's space we need for text, graphics, and video that is lacking in graphical, but it could be added maybe inside your uh, documentation itself. So we're really missing the in-depth uh, attributes that Graphical doesn't really have. So if we go back to our schema, you can see we have our schema, we have introspection, um, then we have optionally Graphical. And then I would, would usually propose people to put a second thing in there, which is static documentation. And the static documentation, it is a add-on to Graphical. So you have Graphical, which is a way to dynamically use the API, but then you still want some static way to give more in-depth explanations around your GraphQL API, what it does, how you can use it, um, 
that goes beyond what you can see in graphical. So there are plenty of static documentation generators for GraphQL that use the same format that we saw before. So graphical is using your GraphQL schema. In the same way, there is also static documentation generators that will use your GraphQL schema to generate static documentation that you can then enhance with stuff like video, graphics, or more text in case you want to. Here are some examples. We have Magidoc, we have Spectacle, and then we have DocuQL. Some of them are actually based on libraries for REST APIs that use OpenAPI or Swagger to generate the documentation for you. Um, and they all give you the ability to uh, list all the different operations that you have. So these are quite similar to endpoints for a REST API. And then for you to enhance them with additional information that you're willing to give. You can even put in links that go directly to graphical or maybe embed graphical inside your static documentation. Or the StackBlitz example, which I sent you earlier, you can also use StackBlitz to run a graphical in there. I mean, the possibilities are quite endless because you have the static documentation and GraphQL already gives you the hard part, which is dynamic. Dynamic is hard because it takes a lot of effort to actually build these, while static is, well, easier to do because you don't need to build code, you need to build words. I'm not saying words are easier uh, to write than building codes, uh, but you get what I mean. If GraphQL had no capabilities to give you a dynamic usage of the library, it would probably be a dead end because you cannot do stuff that is not supported by the product. So we have this static um, API documentation, and then we can use graphical to enhance the uh, examples that you give in here. So they let you extend it with text, markdown, and even JavaScript. So if you know how to work with JavaScript, you can actually make these uh, static documentation builders even better by adding uh, more examples that are tailored to the end users of your products. And in here, you can explain installation, authentication, troubleshoot, um, and much more. Whatever you like to explain there, you can put it in there. And so we have two things we would have for graphical, um, which is dynamic. And then we have a static one, which is just static documentation, which you can host on uh, even your company website, wherever you like to host it. And where graphical is uh, comes in handy to describe and instruct, the static docs can actually be used to also explain what your products look like. And if you merge them together, you actually have all three things. So we have describe in both graphical and static docs. And as they're using the same uh, schema, because you both generate them from the schema, they have the same sorts of truth. So if you update something in your GraphQL schema, the static docs and graphical can both be updated with the same info without any additional effort. And then graphical is lacking the explain, explain features. And these are things we can do in the static docs because in there you can put in text, video, graphics, uh, what else? Maybe you can even put in a podcast if that's what you like. And then for instruct, static docs are really harder for instructions because they are static. In the um, dynamic documentation, which is graphical, it's easier for us to add instructions because you can actually give people code that they can execute and run. So together they're actually uh, well, a true rocket ship because this way you will have static documentation, dynamic documentation, all coming from one GraphQL schema. And you can do all three things that you like to do with your GraphQL, uh, with your API documentation in this scenario for GraphQL, which is describing, explaining, and instructing people how to use a product. So this was uh, the information I wanted to give to you today. Uh, as I said before, uh, you can use Twitter to contact me after this talk. And if you have any questions now, I will be happy to, um, to help you get them answered. Thank you, Roy. Um, one question coming one from question. the audience from Tim. Ooh, I have an echo. Um, how is documenting a GraphQL API different from other types of APIs? Yeah, that's a good question because um, in theory it isn't. It's just more convenient because you have a GraphQL schema that you can use to generate the GraphQL API documentation from. Whereas with a REST API, uh, you typically need to do this by hand. So you or your developers, uh, they need to put in annotations in the code to make sure that you get something that you can use in your documentation or 
uh, the documentation isn't linked to the code itself, meaning that if someone updates the code, there's no one that tells you to update the documentation or the, op the documentation cannot update uh, by itself. Well, with GraphQL, you always need to have a GraphQL schema to run a GraphQL API. So, and this schema can be used for your documentation. And uh, as this is a requirement to actually have a GraphQL API, you always have up-to-date documentation if you use this schema to generate this documentation for you. And with REST or maybe other APIs like SOAP APIs or whatever kind of APIs people are using today, um, it is harder because you don't have the schema. So it's either up to the developers to create schema annotations that you can use, or it's up to the, uh, the creator of the documentation to explore how the API works or expl explore the code to figure out how the API works and then write all of this down uh, without getting updates whenever the API is updated. Mm -hmm. Unless you're, of course, in good communication with the rest of your team. Mm -hmm. And another question, how do you embed examples in the GraphQL schema? So you don't really embed examples in the GraphQL schema. What you do have, you have the graphical playground. And in there, you can use the uh, query parameters in the URL uh, to actually show a demo query, uh, which is like a demo request. And this can then be used by um, someone that is viewing your API. But also, if you create a static documentation next to the dynamic documentation, uh, you can show people how to do requests in there by embedding the graphical or by embedding any other types of code that is using the GraphQL API. Um, so you don't really embed them in the schema. Uh, you use the schema to create a documentation. And in documentation, that's the place where you would embed the examples. Next question. If we already have standards at guidelines for REST and uh, open data, we could use the same rules for descriptions? Um, well, it really depends, I'd say, because if you're using the same API in REST and OData, you would be, I don't know, maybe we're transforming this API into GraphQL, then probably you could. Uh, there are actually uh, libraries that help you to transform existing APIs into GraphQL APIs. So that could be a way to reuse the, the rules or descriptions. Um, so it really depends. I mean, guidelines, they could be pretty much the same. A GraphQL API is pretty much like any other API. You need to send a request to it. The, the shape of the request is a little bit different, but still all the, um, so the standards for formulations of descriptions. Um, I'm not really sure if I know what you mean, um, but if you have a field that is, I don't know, a user ID in GraphQL, and it's a user ID in any other REST API or any other API, uh, it will still be a user ID. So you can till, still tell people how to use it, what it means, um, or what you should use it for. This. So how writing descriptions is pretty much the same. Uh, although you need to define them in the GraphQL schema as schema annotations there. Uh, whereas for REST and OData, you maybe do it in a separate place. If you want to keep your descriptions uh, connected to the code, uh, then you should do it in a GraphQL uh, schema. And if you have a style guide, like um, Michelle asks for writing API guidelines, then I assume you can still use the same style guide because the style guide is a way for you as a company to determine how you would write documentation. And uh, it shouldn't really matter if that should be for a REST API or OData or GraphQL, I'd say. But if you maybe could share any examples, it would be, uh, I can maybe give you a more uh, more customized, customized answer. Mm -hmm. You can also be on Twitter or uh, if you'd like to follow on later. Oh, your Twitter handle was get hack team, right? Get, get hack team. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll link here. I'm not on Mastodon yet, in case people are, but. Uh... <laughs> Do you find, um, as a practicing advice or helping um, the user experience, do you find that there's a, this, fundamental shared assumption in the very, very beginning that often needs to be clarified for people who have not worked with GraphQL before. Something that anybody who has ever worked with a Graph GraphQL API has, it's like, it's it's not even a question. We don't want to talk about it. 
but that often it's that 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 first step zero of assumption that maybe need to be cleared on on the very beginning of any kind of documentation i don't know if it's clear mm -hmm. what i'm trying to ask yeah so I always like to say that GraphQL is quite similar to REST in terms that it's just HTTP. So you would send a request to a GraphQL API in the same way you would do to any other API. The biggest difference is uh, you would need to define what fields you'd like to be retrieved from the API. So if you would define a set of fields, then you will get that data back and not any other data. And what I know from people that are only used to REST, um, you get used to the fact that you need to send a request to the API only to figure out what data is available, unless someone put in the hard work to write a uh, documentation for you. So the biggest difference really is that with GraphQL, you have control over the data uh, that you receive because you shape the request to the API. While with REST, you have no control on the data that's being returned. You send a request to an API endpoint, and then you really need to hope that you will get data back that is usable for you as a developer. Mm -hmm. And this being you practicing this out in the wild to 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 make documentation better and better, more usable, is this fundamental understanding so widespread that it's not even a question? Or when someone documents this, um, they do have to clarify these things. I'm really going down um, to the basics. Like when we do, we all understand. Does it even have to be explained? Mm -hmm. Okay, GraphQL, go Google it. What is GraphQL? Or or do you have to write that? This is a REST API. This is a graph. <laughs> do you advise people to even put that before they are faced with these different types of documentation yeah. layouts? Or just yeah, okay, so this is GraphQL that's... API, period. Go Google it if you don't understand. How do you <laughs> how do you approach this? I mean, there are maybe companies that would take an approach like this, but I would say that's why you need to static documentation because otherwise you tell people we have a GraphQL API here it is go figure it out. Um, so if you have if you are using GraphQL or REST or whatever other types of APIs in your product or your service, or maybe you're using like JavaScript or Python or Go or whatever, I typically say if you have a product that's using uh, another technology, you typically want to explain what this technology is, even for people that are very new. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be, um, well, it could just be one tiny link in the beginning of all your docs. If you're not familiar with XYZ, go there and we've explained it for you in a way that should be easy for you to understand. Because otherwise, it will pretty much be like you go to IKEA, you get a, um, you get something there that you'd like to assemble, mm -hmm. and then they give you tools, but they don't tell you how the tools work. Typically, there's this small picture showing you you need to use a screwdriver in this way. Uh, although it's probably quite common to understand what a screwdriver looks like. Although there is this funny video of someone of the Kardashians trying to cut a cucumber. And then I think maybe should, people should have explanations how a knife would work because they don't know how to use a knife, for example. So um, what I'm trying to get to is that in your daily experience, is GraphQL still another technology? Or like, you know, Years ago, it had to be explained what is a REST API because it was new to so many people. Now it's like self-evident. Anybody who even looks at the docs, uh, yeah, API, REST API, moving on. Is GraphQL yeah. still another technology or it's widespread? Um, I'm asking for your experience. Yeah. So it really depends what you're asking. I'd say if you ask, I don't know, maybe front-end developers, they probably know what a GraphQL API is. If you ask backend developers, they maybe don't. If you ask technical writers, then it will be really diverse. If you ask product managers, then there's a higher chance that they won't. So I think for GraphQL, it's probably good to put in there, what is GraphQL? Uh, actually to explain people what's going on. For REST APIs, maybe you don't need to. It would be enough if you just specify you have a REST API. Um, I saw someone asking something about OData. Well, OData is also, I guess not that common, I guess, across all companies. So it would be good to also explain people what OData is. But if you're using JavaScript or maybe a JavaScript library or some Python libraries for your own library, I would always advise people to put just a small introduction in there um, just to let people know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So in the meanwhile, I don't see more questions, but Michelle sent you the, the clarifications. I wonder if from the audience, if there's more questions. And then uh, you can see in the chat, so you can find Roy on Twitter uh, at uh, Get Hack Team, G-E-T-H-A-C-K-T-E-A-M for further going down into the rabbit hole. Yeah, to give Michelle uh, one last answer, uh, I think you can reuse most of your API naming guidelines or what is an API and all these different things. Although naming conventions probably would be maybe a little bit different. GraphQL likes to use camel casing instead of kebab casing for naming. Um, and it would definitely put in uh, an introduction there is telling people what GraphQL APIs are so they will know how to um, how to send a request to these APIs. Michelle, are we good or would you like to go further? Cool. Yeah, and um, send me a message on Twitter if I can help. Maybe give a short look at your documentation, mm -hmm. see if people would like it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.